Hi, I'm Eric Glotzer, and thanks for tuning in to Natchez TV. You know, I was surprised to find out that one of the largest beekeeping operations in North America is located just down the road from my house. It seems that the climate here in southwest Mississippi is suitable to honeybees, and they can live here year-round. So I thought it might be a good idea to catch up with a local beekeeper and pick up some facts, and take you along. Hi, I'm Mac Metcalf from Natchez, Mississippi, local beekeeper. Well, I originally got into beekeeping. My father-in-law kept bees for about 10 years, and uh, he was a big gardener and still is a big gardener. And uh, I have a lot of allergies, so I got my first two hives. He quit keeping bees about probably about six or seven years ago. He couldn't keep his bees alive. And I had gotten exposed to the benefits of the honey as far as my allergies. And during the spring and stuff, during the bad time of the year, uh, when the pollen's real heavy, I would get up in the morning and sneeze 150 times. And uh, once I started consuming honey on a regular basis that was local honey, that all subsided and went away. So it just, it just helped my sinuses and helped my health. And uh, I like the taste of it, you know. So honey's just a good product. It's one of the few things out there that is just super, super healthy. Um, they, the Egyptians even were big users of it. It never spoils. They found uh, honey in, in the Egyptian tombs that was 4,000 4, years old and it was still nothing wrong with it. It was still healthy. I don't imagine it probably didn't taste too good. Being It was in clay pots and it had completely crystallized and these pots and stuff, they had to do a little core sample to determine what it was. They didn't even know what it was and uh, I don't know if they ate any of it, but they did test on it and they said it was still fine after 4,000 years. So, okay, these two are two 10 frame boxes and that's what your regular hive body would be like and that's a standard size beehive. Well see, these boxes are basically the standard size that you have for beekeeping, but these are queen castles, which means these are actually three little hives in each one of these boxes. See, there's an entrance in the front for the center one. There's an entrance over here on the side for this side one. And on this other side, there's an entrance for this one. So that's three different hives and that's three different hives. And when they get a little more populated, I'll take them and I'll put them in a five frame nuke box. How many bees per box? One box this size will hold about 30,000 bees. Okay, I'm lighting a smoker and this is one of the most important tools a beekeeper has and I've just got some cardboard and some wood shavings from when I build my boxes and I burn it and I put out, it puts out some smoke and it just kind of has a calming effect on the bees. Bee, honeybee stings you the little stinger stays in you and it rips out of it. See the stinger there? Now that bee's gonna die. But since that bee stung me, now it's put a little firm on and I need to do a little more smoke. See the smoke helps calm the bees down and it also keeps them from being able to put a, a firm on, which is the attack firm on if they need to, or alarm firm on, which would signal uh, the smoke will mask it. So it's kind of like shuts down a lot of their communications as far as like, um, uh, them wanting to be aggressive toward me. So when, when bees get alarmed, they actually put out an alarm pheromone and this smoke covers it up and keeps them from being able to, to pick it up. So the smoke will make them be real calm and like if the bees are all over a top bar or something and you want them to move, you just blow some smoke on them and get them out of your way. Now one thing I'm surprised about is how docile they are, even with the smoke, little minimal smoking. Right. Well, what we're I have, standing here unprotected. And right. I normally, a lot of times, I'll even just wear short pants and short sleeves. And, but what I have done is I graft and braid from my most gentle queen because I like to not have to wear a bunch of protection. So I'm, I'm, I'm perpetuating my gentle bees. If I have mean ones, I don't ever, I don't copy those. I don't reproduce them. The mean ones I don't like because I don't mind getting stung a few times. And so like today so far I've been stung one time and that'll probably be it for the day. And you're still not getting bit. No, these bees, I'm telling you, they know who daddy is. You know, you work with them enough. There's three types of honeybees. You have the male bee, which is the drone. You have the, the worker bee, which is a regular, not complete female bee, which she doesn't lay, she doesn't lay any eggs. And then you have the queen bee and the queens lay all, one queen in each hive lays all the eggs. And on a good day, she'll lay from 2,000 to 3,000 eggs. See, the egg is about 1 20th 
the size of a grain of rice and it looks like just a little grain of rice and it's about the same size as a comma on a piece of type paper. It takes 21 days from when the egg is laid till the bee is hatching out. So this bee right here is 21 days old and it's starting to come out of the cell right there. It's now, trying to. The, are they seasonal or can they hatch out all year? They can hatch out all year so long as it's not very cold. If it's above 50 degrees they can make a they can hatch out and they can make more bees. And, uh, but once it gets, say, below 50 a good bit, they, they don't have, they, they quit laying. The queen will quit laying and it's too cool for them. So they don't, they don't make them all year long. Now, how do you know what kind of bee it's going to be? Well, it's going to be either a worker bee or a queen bee or a drone bee. And, and the drones, like I said, are a lot larger. The cells are larger. So they hatch out of a bigger cell and it protrudes out, sticks out a lot further. So these are all flush. So these are all these are all worker bees. And the queen and a bees. queen will hatch out of a great big old cell. This was a queen cell right here. Now these longer ones that are sticking out a little further, those are drone cells, which means those are going to be male bees when they hatch out. That's going to be your males and the ones that are a little bit shorter. I'm trying to hold it to where you can see the little bit of difference yeah. in the length. And um, so this is. Well, I got honey running down my finger. Look at that. You see all that? Mm. I'll tell you what you do now. Take your finger and just stick it in that right there. No, take your finger. Well, keep it over there. Here, where okay. I can Put, see take it. your finger and push into that right there. Push on in there. Now, oh, now lick wow. your finger. Lick your finger. Oh, yummy. Let me Isn't do that, that again. Good? Let me do that again. Yeah. I didn't realize what you were up to. Uh -huh. Now taste that. That's as fresh as it gets right there. Oh, that's delicious. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, that is fine. Mm-hmm. See this comb? This is all honeycomb, and this is just a little bit of honey that's rolling down the side of this comb. And you see them feeding on it, on the edges here. There she is, there's the queen right there. That's the queen. Now this is a young queen, she's not very old. She hadn't gotten real big. You see the black thorax on her? Mm -hmm. The black hump where it's a lot more pronounced. There she goes, climbed over there, and she's running around. But that's her right there. That's our queen. And she's about a quarter inch longer than the other ones. And she, she'll, she uses her front legs to measure each one of these little cells. And she determines when she lays an egg whether it's a male bee or a female bee. Now, honeybees are haploid diploid. And what that means is if she lays an egg, she can control when she lays an egg. She's fixed to lay an egg right now. She can control whether it's going to be a male bee or a female bee. That's a big drone right there. That's a big male bee. You see that one right there? That's a male. See how his eyes are so much bigger on his head? And there's a worker next to him. He's like twice the size. That's a big, healthy male bee. And he doesn't gather anything. He's just in here feeding. And he's here in case there's a queen around that needs to be mated. And that's the drone's sole purpose. As far as the way you can, um, as far as producing income from being a beekeeper, number one, you can produce and sell honey. Uh, number two, you can produce uh, wax and pollen. And wax is used commercially and industrially and used in makeups and cosmetics and lipstick. And uh, then you can also rent your bees out as far as for pollination services. And you can also sell bees. And since there's such a shortage of bees, you can sell queens and bees. And, and there's a ready market for it. Wholesale on honey in the United States is a $250 million a year is what they say annually. And uh, poll the pollination business, pollinating them hundred those 105 uh, Produce and apples and oranges and whatnot is a is a twenty five billion dollar a year industry and business. So there are more ways to make money off of bees than other just honey. That's right. One of the things about bees that's really neat and it really shows that they're really intelligent is when a honeybee goes out foraging and they find a good nectar source or pollen or a good tree, let's just say like a tulip poplar tree that's producing a lot of nectar, that honeybee will come back to the hive do a little waggle dance by bumping and spinning 
and it's kind of like a Morse code type of system, and the other bees, a hundred of them will be paying attention, and it will give those hundred bees the exact coordinates of where that tree is, and then they'll go out and find that it's loaded down just like, and then they'll come back, and those hundred will do the same little waggle dance and give it, and then a thousand go out, and then they're all working that nectar source. So they work as a team, and they help each other find different nectar pr producing sources and, and water and pollen and flowers and everything, and then they come back, do the little waggle dance, and they communicate that information. They're totally social, and they can't live uh, without being in a hive, you know, with, by themselves. I mean, they, they ha it takes a whole hive of them to survive, so it can't be just a small group of them. Well, it's a really harsh and tough environment for the bees out there today, and uh, a lot of it, the problems are man-made, and then a lot of it is other parasites. And uh, back to what we were saying about pollinating, when these commercial beekeepers take all their bees out to California, they're mixing all the different diseases and viruses and parasites, and then when they bring it back to their home states or whatever, they're carrying it back to their home states, so they're actually man is helping spread a lot of this really bad stuff that's going on to the bees. You see the bees chasing the little hive beetles around? And hive beetles are notorious for getting in your little queen castles and stuff because they, some, the, the queen pheromone uh, isn't as strong on these smaller little nukes and so you have more problems with these little beetles. And I, I normally squash them when I see them. And the little beetles can stay in the hive and when the beetles get a chance they'll lay some eggs and those eggs, a little maggot will hatch out and uh, will slime your hives and can just totally wreck a beehive. Now the, the small hive beetles, the bad thing about them too, not only can they wreck their hive, but they will fly over 100 miles to get into a hive and they carry a lot of viruses. So they, they're spreading disease. They're carrying, this hive beetle might be get, picking something up from somebody else's hive and coming and getting in my hive and then giving it to my bees and then it'll make my bees sicker. But there's also uh, a lot of pesticides that are used. And in my opinion, one of the number one biggest problems that the beekeepers are having in the United States is the systemic neonicotinoid pesticides. Well, how often do bees die? I mean, how long will these bees survive in this? Uh, well, uh, bees during the busy time of year, the workers literally work themselves to death. They, they fly and they, uh, they don't live but about six weeks, and they literally, uh, they wear their wings out to where they don't have any wings left. And uh, you have a whole lot of uh, animals being birds and martins and dragonflies uh, that eat bees. And, and, and just like uh, to a martin, a little mosquito is a little snack, like a potato chip. But a honeybee is like a filet mignon, it's a steak. When they eat, catch a couple of those and eat those, they've got a full meal. But the bees can handle that, and that's Mother Nature taking care of things, and, and those, those things are meant to be, and they're not a problem. And the, the queen, that's why the queen lays two to 3,000 eggs a day. And so a certain amount of them die every day, and a certain amount of them hatch out every day. But you just kind of got to, there's a balance there that has to happen. Another one of the major problems we're having in the United States is we're steadily having diminishing habitat. Uh, the habitat in the United States is st steadily shrinking. We keep building more and more concrete and we keep harvesting and we keep planting back just all pine trees or whatever may, the case may be to where there's, there's nothing for the bees to forage on in a lot of areas. So you have a, a, a lot of problems with less environment. Uh, the government supposedly is working on some different programs to kind of uh, to encourage more people to plant and, and put more bee forage out there to try to kind of help that situation some. And uh, you know, well back, Einstein said that, you know, that um, once the honeybees are all gone, they said man, well, Einstein said that man will be gone in three years. So if we lose all the honeybees, the other thing, the honeybee is kind of like the canary in the, in the coal mine. When the honeybee's dead, uh, we're probably not going to be long behind them, so.